Good afternoon and welcome to all of you to today's online debate organized by the Florence School of Banking and Finance on the topic Big Tech and FinTech Credit. My name is Thorsten Beck and I will be chairing and moderating the debate today. I'm currently Professor of Banking and Finance at the Business School, formerly CAS in London, but will join the amazing team at the Florence School in March as their new director and in September move to EUI as Chair in Financial Stability. Now, uh, the topic of FinTech and uh, Big Tech is a, uh, um, a very timely, very relevant uh, topic, um, especially after the uh, pandemic, um, given that there is a trend towards uh, more digitalization. Uh, and we've seen quite some developments in uh, uh, digital finance, uh, new providers uh, popping up, uh, often referred to as FinTech, uh, but also the large platform companies, uh, uh, Facebook, uh, Google, for example, moving into financial services, sometimes which we refer to as big tech. Now, um, we're gonna, um, we, we won't be able to cover everything today, very obviously, but we're going to cover three um, big chunks in this area. Uh, we're going to first talk a bit about uh, the, giving you a little bit of a landscape, then talk about the competition implications, and then talk about the um, uh, the regulatory implications um, of this um, uh, uh, of these developments. Um, each uh, of our three speakers, whom I'm going to introduce in just a moment, uh, will have uh, seven minutes to present, um, and then um, we're going to go to uh, Q and A. We received already some questions, and we are open for further questions in the Q and A box. So please um, submit your questions uh, in the Q and A box. Uh, of the uh, Zoom uh, Zoom bar. Before continuing, let me just briefly mention that the, this uh, seminar is actually kind of a partly a preview to an upcoming um, training activity that we have in fintech innovation, finance, and regulation, which actually will be led by one of our speakers, uh, Philip Pech from the London School of Economics. We have a few seats remaining. Uh, it's already next month, uh, but there will be another edition in case you're missing that or you won't uh, don't cannot commit at this stage uh, in September. Uh, and we will open this, uh, the registration for this later in this uh, semester. Um, we have other uh, training activities, uh, as you can see here, um, network analysis and finance economics, panel data for banking sector analysts, analysts and then the Bank Resolution Academy later in, uh, in uh, April. Before I continue, let me mention just one more activity. We have a kind of a new series, uh, the so-called Bank Board Academy. Um, which started in December, and we're going to have our next seminar in this series in uh, in just uh, three weeks, a little bit more than three weeks, um, um, among uh, uh, under the, the title for and proper assessment, uh, better board for better banks uh, with uh, Eduardo Fernandez Boyo as uh, uh, our main speaker and uh, Elena Scaletti, the founding uh, chair of the founding director of the FBF uh, as a moderator. So, but now let's turn to the topic of today, uh, which is big tech and fintech credit. Um, and I would like to start each of the presentation uh, with a poll. So the first poll, yes, the first poll is uh, what do you think or how do you think the COVID-19 pandemic will affect the growth of big tech credit in Europe? Big tech credit will uh, accelerate, it will grow less quickly, it will actually be further constrained by regulation, or it will not be directly affected. So um, voting is open. And while you are voting on this poll, let me introduce our first speaker, um, John Frost, who is uh, part of a very exciting um, a new unit in the Bank for International Settlement on innovation in the digital economy. And he works on policy-oriented research on fintech and digital innovation. He has written quite extensively in this area. And before working at the BIS, he also works, worked at the FSB, which is in the same building, uh, the Netherlands banks, uh, and also in academia and the private sector in uh, Germany. So he is um, quite versed uh, in this uh, topic. And we're very excited to have him to kind of give us a kind of an overview of uh, the latest development and trends in big tech and uh, fintech. Um, before I give him the word, um, um, Jan, can you please uh, tell us uh, how the poll is going and um, whether we have a result? Indeed. So big tech credit growth will accelerate has gotten 71% of the votes. So the majority is quite clear in that aspect. You'll find the whole bulk of the results in the chat box in just a few seconds. Okay, lovely. Great. Good. Then over to you, John, please. Um, 
give us on, uh, your insights. Thank you very much, Torsten, and uh, thanks for the chance to uh, to present today. Um, it's uh, it's really a pleasure to be able to to draw from current research and be able to talk about uh, big tech and fintech credit, and particularly to talk about the European context. So, as, uh, as Torsten mentioned, I've, I've uh, worked in in various contexts in Europe for for some time at a national central bank, also um, in in, uh, in the private sector, and. Um, I've noticed that Europe is a bit, uh, a bit special in global context, so I'd like to um, try to talk about that and, and show how um, big tech and fintech credit markets in Europe compare also to, uh, for instance, the large markets in North America and in Asia. So um, I'll start by, by noting that this draws on research, uh, which is joint work with uh, colleagues from the Cambridge Centre for Alternative Finance and at the BIS. And of course, these, uh, these are my views, not necessarily those of the BIS. So I wanted to start with, um, with some groundwork. Uh, this is uh, perhaps necessary before we talk about you know, fintech and big tech credit, what are they? And, um, and to start with, um, fintech of course is a very broad trend that's been uh, you know, uh, transforming financial services in a number of areas for, for several years now. And the FSB defines uh, fintech simply as technology enabled innovation in financial services, noting that it could result in new business models, applications, processes, or products. And I think many people are aware of the large uh, fintech providers. So there have been a number of challengers who often focus entirely on financial services in areas such as payments or insurance or wealth management, and often uh, have you know, more niche business models, uh, more focused business models that really focus on using technology for one area of financial services. So Stripe or in, in Europe, Adyen are, are large payment providers, of course, TOS and Paytm in Asia, also in payments, um, Robinhood is uh, in wealth management, Lemonade, uh, and Jong'an are in insurance. And these are, again, uh, firms that, that tend to focus on a particular uh, vertical in financial services using technology to, um, to improve that. Fintech credit, of course, is one part of the overall fintech space, focusing specifically on lending. So this is credit activity facilitated by online platforms that are not operated by commercial banks, so peer-to-peer -peer or marketplace lending is one example. And in Europe, there, there's quite a bit of this, as I'll also discuss in, in just a moment. Uh, Zopa is actually the oldest um, uh, provider of, uh, of fintech credit. It was founded in the UK. Funding Circle, of course, also uh, Mintos. And uh, internationally, there are many more examples, Lending Club, SoFi, uh, Lufax, et cetera. Now, Big tech is different because big tech providers don't only do financial services, they also have a large range of non-financial business lines. So these are large companies whose primary activity is digital services rather than financial services. And here at the BIS we've written um, on, uh, on big tech and, uh, and what makes it different. And <clears throat> internationally, of course, the, the largest players are in the United States and in China. So Ant Group and um, Tencent, which operates WeBank, are of course very large, but also Amazon, Facebook, Google, um, as, as Torsten mentioned in the, at the start. In Europe, uh, the, the largest players, you know, we, we count telecoms that, uh, that have financial operations uh, also as part of this. So Orange, uh, for instance, has Orange Bank um, and uh, Vodafone and Pesa, of course, is a, a subsidiary of Vodafone, um, headquartered in the UK but they are relatively fewer compared to the large um, big techs that operate in, in Asia or in North America. Now we've done work um, with Cambridge Center for Alternative Finance, uh, looking at the growth of FinTech and big tech credits. And this is shown on the left. This, uh, this chart uh, appears simple, but there's uh, I think literally hundreds of man hours behind it in, uh, in putting together the, the data that's shown here. And you'll see big tech uh, shown here in, in blue bars. And uh, what, what jumps out of this is that big tech credit is booming. So at the global level, uh, there was about $572 billion uh, in uh, big tech lending in 2019. We're currently assembling data for 2020. We hope to have that soon. And it's actually an open question uh, whether uh, big tech credit has uh, increased or decreased during the COVID-19 pandemic. Certainly there's been greater demand for credit um, from, from borrowers. But um, big tech companies have also said um, that given the higher credit risk during the pandemic, they've also lowered limits. And, um, and it, it's, it's very much an open question uh, whether the lending has actually increased or not. But um, what's, uh, what's striking here is that uh, you know, so much of this, a very large part is actually in, in Asia. 
So if you look uh, by country, um, on the right, you can see this with a logarithmic scale, FinTech and Big Tech credits. Uh, China is by far the largest market for both. And actually, interestingly, there, there's, um, the FinTech credit is, uh, is declining very rapidly in China, but until now, um, FinTech credit was, uh, was rather, rather brisk and Big Tech credit uh, has also been increasing. Other large markets for Big Tech credit include uh, Korea, Japan, Indonesia, um, Russia, Kenya, and actually uh, European markets come very far after that. So the, the UK, um, France uh, have, have some big tech credit, but it's uh, much, much smaller than, um, than either uh, uh, the Asian countries or, or the United States and the number of developing economies. What Europe does have a lot of is, uh, is fintech credit. So fintech credit has grown very fast in Europe and in a number of countries, including Italy, the Netherlands, um, the UK, Germany, France, uh, there's actually more than $1 billion of, um, uh, of fintech credit. So this is peer-to-peer -peer lending, marketplace lending in 2019. And you can see that's been a fairly dramatic growth. Again, we're still waiting for, uh, for information on uh, what happened during the COVID-19 pandemic, but at least before the pandemic, it was growing very rapidly. And um, I think uh, it's useful also on this slide to note uh, the, the developments in China. I mentioned that, uh, that China has seen a decline in, in fintech credit volumes, and that's due to some idiosyncratic factors, including a, a regulatory crackdown on peer-to-peer -peer platforms in China. Um, and so you can see that uh, particularly uh, compared to, uh, to the developments in, in China, Europe stands out as a place where fintech credit is, uh, is still really taking off. I see there is one question on how big tech is defined. And I think this is important perhaps to, to quickly mention. So big tech credit uh, is defined as lending activity by uh, large companies whose primary activity is digital services rather than financial services. And it's important to state here that big tech credit is credit extended both directly by big tech companies and by big tech companies in partnership with incumbent financial institutions. So both forms of lending are, are seen in countries around the world. Uh, just to give very concrete examples, uh, Amazon lends to small businesses uh, that sell on the Amazon platform, for instance, the United States and also the United Kingdom. Uh, Orange Bank is a subsidiary of Orange and uh, has uh, lending to, um, to its uh, clients in, in France. So um, these are examples of, uh, of big tech credit uh, also in Europe. In many other European countries, there, there's not yet uh, an example of uh, big tech credit. So I just wanted to close with regulation, which I think will hopefully be a nice segue to uh, Loriana and, uh, and Philip in, uh, in the later sessions. Uh, and just to say that um, there's been a very large regulatory debate about um, uh, how to uh, address uh, the risks from, uh, from, from FinTech and big tech credit. Um, <clears throat> and on big tech, I think, um, you know, particularly given the scale of, of big techs, not only in financial services, but in a number of other industries, uh, there's been a lot of discussion about competition issues. In finance, there's a discussion of systemic importance and too big to fail. And so increasingly, it seems that authorities are leaning more toward an entity-based approach uh, to big tech, perhaps to complement activities-based regulation. And here are just a few examples. So in, in China, I think people are aware that the State Administration for Market Regulation uh, uh, issued draft guidelines on internet companies in November. And of course, there are a number of measures uh, by the financial regulators around Ant Group and other big techs uh, regarding their lending activities. In the United States, uh, there's been work on antitrust uh, toward big techs. So the House Subcommittee on Antitrust Commercial and Administrative Law put out a report in October. And in Europe, uh, there is the Draft Digital Services Act and Digital Markets Act. And um, I think that it's, uh, it seems that Europe is also taking an ambitious approach, uh, likely entity-based, that will address some of the specific risks uh, from big tech. So we'll have a chance to go into this in, in more detail, but I'd like to now pass back to, uh, to Torsten and to our next speakers. Thank you very much, uh, John, for this introductory um, um, uh, kind of overview, which uh, I think uh, shows the, uh, the, the importance uh, of big tech credit and fintech credit. Of course, there's much more to be said in terms of all the regional variation, uh, which maybe we come back to later. But let me ask you one question, which actually also came up uh, already for, before the, uh, before the event. Uh, can you just spend maybe uh, 35 seconds on uh, the implication for financial inclusion? I mean, you mentioned already M-Pesa, uh, which started in Kenya, but is also now active in other countries. Um, and what is the role of big tech um, 
as you define it, like the, the phone companies, mobile phone companies uh, in, this, uh, in this context. Absolutely. So big tech has a number of uh, unique characteristics, including its, its hyperscalability. So big tech providers often have uh, access to large networks from their non-financial businesses. They have access to user data. They have a broad range of activities. So we've written about this DNA feedback loop, which allows hyperscalability data network activities. Um, and this is very powerful. It can be very powerful for good, for financial inclusion, for instance. And we've seen this with M-Pesa and uh, indeed with uh, Ant, um, you know, Ant Group, uh, Alipay and, uh, and WeChat Pay in, in China. Um, we've seen that uh, these innovations have reached you know, tens and hundreds of millions of users in a very short amount of time because they are hyperscalable, because um, you know, they are very cheap to uh, onboard additional users. But these same forces also lead to all of the questions around competition and around systemic importance that I mentioned. So it is a double-edged sword, this, uh, this DNA feedback loop. It can be very powerful for financial inclusion, but it can also be very uh, disruptive for, um, for fair competition in markets. Okay, well, thank you very much, uh, John. Um, so now I'll be turning to the, uh, before I turn to the next speaker, Loriana, let me uh, ask Jan to put up our second poll. So what effect will higher financial sector competition due to the entry of fintechs and big techs have on financial stability? It will ensure greater stability. It will result in less stability or even a crisis. There won't be any major effect on stability or completely different, the entry of fintech and big tech will not increase competition. So please go ahead and vote. And in the meantime, I'd like to introduce um, uh, Loriana Pelisson, who is the program director of the research center SAFE um, in, uh, at the Goethe University in Frankfurt, um, which is now one of the major um, uh, research centers um, in, uh, in Germany focused on financial sector issues. She's the, also the chair of law and finance. Uh, additionally, she's also a part-time full professor of economics in uh, beautiful Venice and a research affiliate at uh, MIT Sloan. And she has also worked uh, a across a lot of areas in, uh, in finance, uh, including on FinTech and Big Tech and including on the issue of uh, competition and um, um, uh, stability. And so here we have the, um, the results uh, as, you, as a challenge for you, Loriana, it will result in less stability. That seems to be the, uh, the kind of uh, what most people say uh, with the second uh, kind of tight, uh, either greater stability or no effect at all. It's, it's interesting that very few people say that it will not increase stability at all. So Loriana, over to you. We cannot hear you, you have to unmute. So thank you very much for giving me uh, the opportunity to uh, you know, share some ideas about uh, competition and the perimeter of the fintech, big tech and banks in the uh, European Union. So the focus is uh, on uh, uh, specifically on, on Europe and actually on the European Union. And you know, one of the first questions that we need to ask when we are talking about co how these different institutions of different companies will compete and will eventually disrupt the uh, incumbent is uh, what is different for finance with respect to what we have already observed for several other markets like uh, you know retail uh, and agency businesses where uh, you know we know very well what's happening in terms of Amazon and TripAdvisor and uh, even more what is going on now with the with the crisis. Clearly, on one side, finance is having many points on both similarities and differences with respect to these other sectors. On one side, you know, uh, finance is not really asking too much physical infrastructure. So this is why maybe uh, you know, it will be very easy to compete under this framework. But as we all know, it is highly, uh, the regulation is very large. So it is highly subject to regulation. Then clearly this will uh, affect a lot how these different institution, FinTech and BinTech, uh, eventually will be able to compete in the credit market. Uh, but let me just summarize, I'm using this uh, beautiful picture that has been provided in, a, uh, let's say, by this, uh, in this paper, that is characterizing where and under which dimension FinTech is competing with banks. Uh, you know, and it is under different dimension, you know, on one side in terms of lending by digital banking, by, fintech balance sheet lending and uh, loan crowdfunding, and some of these companies has been already highlighted by John in his presentation, 
you know, it can, can be used for capital rising. It can be used as asset management for robo advisory. It can be used largely for payments. It's affecting a lot of the payment system. And then it's also going to affect uh, uh, another important part of the financial system that is the insurance market and also the part related to crypto assets. So financial activities related to crypto assets, cryptocurrencies and so on. Uh, but, uh, you know, if several of these activities are at the core of what usually banks are doing, banks are doing all of these activities together. And uh, the reason of why they're doing several of these activities together is to exploit their ability to do, to have economy, economy of scope. Think tech instead are largely very specialized and look into each of these type of activities uh, in most of the case in a separate way. Difference is for big tech. Big tech, as uh, John already uh, stressed, and it is, I think, I'm using here the classical picture and uh, definition that the BIS is already uh, proposing by two years, I think, is that you know big tech are very large companies. And thanks to their activities, they are able to collect a lot of data. And thanks to this data, they are also able you know, to uh, pretty much get access to a very significant network uh, of, uh, of people and, and also not just on the number of people, but how these people interact among each other. And based on this, they are also able to expand their activities. And thanks to this, they are collecting even further data and so on. And this is a, a circular e effect that will generate uh, this huge, let's say, uh, network uh, effect that will amplify their capacity. So clearly, they are largely different than fintech. And for this reason, they are competing with bank in a completely different way. So now let's move to you know, the financial system. And clearly the way in which this both big tech and think tech can compete in the financial system is depend on how is the financial system. So you know, we know that uh, around the world, we have financial system that are largely bank-based, like Europe, for example, continental Europe. Another part that is largely market-based, like the US and in part also UK. And uh, I'm putting FinTech here because this will help us to understand how they can compete in this framework. And then potentially we will end up to have a sort of big tech-based financial system. And this is something that we do not observe so far, but uh, uh, so that's why I'm largely you know, guessing on how this type of framework will be. And I'm going to analyze this framework under three different dimensions. Clearly, what are the competitive advantages and what are, of course, also the disadvantages of, uh, you know, of these three type of framework in terms of uh, uh, the different financial activities? What are the fragilities if we will have, uh, you know, a market or a system characterized largely by banks, by fintech or by big tech? And what are then the financial stability instruments that we have? Uh, in place in order you know to address these fragilities so let's start with the one that we know already bank base you know banks do have a, co a significant competitive advantage uh, advantage with respect to the other that is the deposit this is the main reason of why they are regulated and they have in principle a significant deposit rent uh, at least they have deposit insurance now with negative interest rate how large is this deposit rent we can discuss but in any case you know they have deposit and this is usually uh, their way to get a lot of information from their clients and so on. And based on this, they are exploiting their economy of scope. So from the deposit, then they are also able to provide credit. They are able to provide services. They are able to serve the payment system. Several, all, pretty much all the different things that I just stressed before, they're all done all together in the balance sheet of the bank. What we know is that uh, for a already 20 years, we are now in the framework of a secular disintermediation. So we already know that this type of business is already you know, uh, going to reduce their significance and uh, uh, it is largely affected by this disintermediation effect. What are the fragility of this system? Well, bank run, we know very well. And second, we know the issue of the too big to fail that will generate systemic risk and we are indeed trying to address these two problems largely with regulation and supervision, and on the other side, having the lender of last resort. What about the market-based fintech? You know, already with the secular disintermediation, 
even before that we have the classical fintech, we already observed that you know there was a lot of securitization and a significant fraction of the activities were uh, parcelized and specialized. So you have uh, companies just doing one thing, not all the different things that banks are uh, were doing. And now with fintech, this is uh, in some sense exacerbated. Clearly, this is giving a lot of market efficiency. It is benefiting a lot of the secular disintermediation, but this let's say framework is then characterized and will be eventually characterized if uh, you know fintech will be uh, significantly present by market ranks in this case we will have also fire sales as a big problem because everything is intermediated by the market in this case and then we know already by the evidence that this type of activities is largely characterized by procyclicality they react fast uh, more fast to change in the environment than banks are usually doing. And this is creating uh, immediately procyclicality. From in terms of financial stability, we have all the regulation that so far it has been used for the market. Maybe it's not enough. Uh, clearly regulation, supervision, and then we have started already observe the uh, possibility to have a market maker of last resort. I'm putting a question mark because it's not clear how far we can go on this. Then let's move to the big tech. Big tech, we know they have this uh, huge advantage of having this DNA, so this ability you know, to have economy, economy of scope and also efficiency. Uh, it is, they are, of course, benefiting of the secular, secular disintermediation, but they are having then the big problem of being too big to fail. They have a lot of issue in terms of investor consumer private rights, you know, investor protection, what are we doing with this data? Uh, they are competing in an unfair way with the, with the rest of, of the system because, you know, they are in some sense using data that are not available to all the other and uh, it is not clear how they are using it. And in terms of financial stability instrument, well, uh, you know, I'm leaving this largely to the next speaker because uh, there is a lot of things that can be done and can be said, but uh, so far, you know, uh, we didn't see too much. There are some attempts just in the few last few months by uh, different countries, as already John has stressed. But uh, as you can see, uh, we need really to figure out what will be the final result and how this different type of framework will interact in the near future. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, Loriana. Just to uh, push you a bit on that. So the, the poll question that we uh, put up earlier, uh, where the majority said that actually the higher competition caused by the entry of fintech and big tech will actually reduce stability. Do you agree this, with this or would you say it really depends? Um, well, I will say that it will really depends on how we will react in terms of, you know, uh, financial stability instruments. Hmm. Okay, that's important, yeah. Thanks, sorry, if, if I may ask uh, one more follow-up question, this was actually also um, uh, came in, the, in the, already in the Q&A box and I think also before the seminar. How do you see the impact of both fintech and big tech on uh, the banking sector? Um, and on the shadow banking sector. Yeah, so you know, so as I just said, the uh, both fintech and, and big tech are already, you know, uh, uh, appearing in a framework where uh, the, the the banking sector in Europe is uh, uh, characterized by very low uh, mm -hmm. return on equity, by the fact that they need to shrink because there is overbanking. And on this side, I think uh, the fact that there is over, over banking, this is justifying why fintech do have a lot of problem in the continental Europe to develop. Because, you know, pretty much it's not that the system is working so bad. It's not like in uh, emerging markets where, you know, people do not have access to the banking services. You know, Europe is already well served. And this is why, in some sense, uh, uh, and it is relatively cheap also compared to the US, you know, the services provided by, by European banks are far cheaper than the one in the US. And, and this is maybe one of the reasons why bank in Europe are uh, given this huge competition are also not so profitable. So this, this in some sense is justifying why it's difficult for FinTech to expand in Europe. In terms of big tech, even they are not expanding too much in Europe. Let's see what is going on after the crisis, this uh, COVID-19. But so far, as John already showed, they are not expanding in Germany, for example. We do not see any big tech able to provide any credit to people. And even in the other countries like Italy, Spain, France, and so on, uh, maybe John can, can add to this, but it doesn't seem that from his data, 
there is a significant, let's say, presence. So uh, this, is telling, this is telling us that it is very difficult for fintech and big tech to expand in a framework where there is already a lot of overbanking. Okay, well, thank you very much, Loriana. Actually, I want to ask our third speaker for a little bit more patience and just turn it back to John, actually, and ask him uh, briefly how um, whether you agree with Loriana's assessment and also with the, I mean, the, one thing is the data, looking at the data, the other is, of course, of uh, the, the causes of why we don't see the same kind of uh, boom in big fintech and big tech, in, uh, especially in the continent, I guess, uh, than we yeah. see, for example, in China, but also in the U.S. Yeah, so I, I agree with uh, Loriana. I think that um, quite simply, there, there's less unmet demand for financial services, particularly for credit in Europe. I mean, uh, there, there's a very wide range of banks. Uh, there are examples of small businesses that, that you know, report not being able to access credit. So it's not that uh, the demand is entirely met, but I think that relative to the United States or China uh, or a number of emerging markets, um, the, the market is, is better served. And I think the regulatory approach is um, stricter in, uh, in Europe as well. Um, in some countries, uh, you know, a banking license is required for these types of activities. Uh, and in other places, um, authorities have, I think, been uh, more reluctant to allow big techs to, to do the sorts of things they've been able to do in China or um, a number of other markets around the world. So I think it is a mix of the existing structure of the banking sector and the regulatory approach. Wonderful. Thank you very much, John. And this kind of smoothly leads us to the, the third topic today. Um, before I introduce our third speaker, let's put up our third poll. Um, should fintech and big techs providing credits be regulated on the basis of an activity-based, entity-based, or risk-based approach? Activity, what are they doing? Entity, the institution as such, or a risk-based according to how much risk they pose to the uh, financial system? Uh, you have these three options. Um, and of course, the fourth one is the, I guess uh, we can call it the laissez-faire approach. Uh, they should not be regulated at all. So while you uh, vote on this poll, let me introduce our third speaker, um, Philip Pech, who is an associate professor of financial law and regulation at the London School of Economics uh, since 2010. Uh, he's also the director of uh, the LSD's Law and Financial Markets Project. And um, he's also actually a fellow, a, um, and well, used to be a fellow, now a visiting professor at the um, University of Frankfurt, so the same place as where Loriana uh, teaches and researches. He also has spent, uh, before joining LSE, quite some years at the heart of international legal and regulatory reform, including working for the uh, European Commission. So, uh, Jan, if you could maybe see the uh, results of our poll. Yes, a, okay, it's tight. 48%, so almost half say a risk-based approach, uh, and then uh, um, followed by the activities-based uh, approach. Um, it's interesting, very few think that actually uh, they should not be regulated at all. So I think that gives you a good basis, uh, Philip, uh, for your presentation. Over to you, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Torsten, for this very kind introduction. Let me just uh, bring up my, let me just bring up my slides. So can everyone see these slides? Yes, we can. Thank yes, you. thank you very much. So I'm extremely grateful to my, to my colleagues for, for their uh, presentations because they have not only said a number of very important things, so, which are also important in my, co uh, in my context, they've also sharpened my mind for something which I had forgotten that I should say it actually, but now I say it in the very first place. We are kind of playing here, we are juggling here with labels, yeah, we are talking about banks, we are talking about fintechs in the term of companies, we are talking about big techs and so on. But these labels, they are, these are just labels. So what we really need to think about is the activity, what is going on and what is the risk that they are creating. And they are, you are already seeing where I'm going with this little presentation because I'm clearly going in the direction of uh, risk-based approach. Um, why am I saying this? Um, I'm saying this because um, I think, and this is the outcome of the work of uh, an ex expert group of the European Commission, which I chaired about a year ago, which we, we delivered our report a little bit more than a year ago. And what one of the fundamental findings of this report was, well, we shouldn't make that distinction actually between fintech and traditional finance. Yeah, it, there's no such there's no such distinction. We all use technology, 
And therefore also somewhat, I, I usually try to avoid the word FinTech like for describing an entity, a FinTech company. I would rather say uh, specialized technology enabled financial provider. This is also basically what John said as an explanation for the term earlier, because incumbent banks, uh, even very traditional banks uh, are using tech quite a lot. So they are also in a sense FinTech. And therefore I, I think we always need to be very, very careful when using these labels. What matters for us really, yeah, and here I come to regulation is how we want to see the market and how we want to see the market that we achieve through regulation. Regulation is always like finding the right middle way of avoiding risks on the one hand and on the other hand, um, providing the ground for um, the materialization of opportunities in the market. So, and in doing this regulation, we, we want to shape our market. And I came up here, uh, I come up here with a, with a proposal for the rationales, how, for how, for, 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 sh um, for shaping our market. So the rationales are very typical. We want growth. We want everyone to benefit from it. We want to avoid risks. For this, we need to do basically two things. We need to uh, provide for market efficiency, and that uh, includes supporting measures and as at the same at the same time also curbing measures so kind of restricting market activity and at the same time we need to avoid systemic crashes then as a slightly as a as a regulatory rationale which is slightly apart we have consumer protection that is something that is more attached to ideas of human human rights and equal opportunities and similar things and on this basis yeah if we think what do we actually want to achieve stability growth efficient market yeah where it makes sense to do business where it makes sense to be innovative on this basis we then look what market participants are actually doing and here i come back to the classification and for purposes of our little talk today i have uh, adopted um the uh, categorization proposed by the title of the conference, big techs and fintechs, notably. So I would usually make the distinction between incumbents, big techs, and specialized technology-driven startups, Yeah, just to be a little bit more descriptive. But let's just stick, stick with the term fintech. So here we are looking uh, at what uh, at the at the map of market market actors. So first group of market actors are the incumbents, banks, insurance companies, money market funds, uh, other types of investment funds, payment service providers, and so on. And I mentioned payment service providers. Yeah, look at this. There are payment service providers like the card companies, Mastercard. I mean, they are doing tech. They are doing this for decades. They are not doing anything which is so fundamentally different. Payment over the internet from what PayPal does or what from what now. Tencent does or Amazon tries to introduce yeah, everywhere. So this is why I say these, these, these lines between the different categories, they are very, very, they are blurred. Yeah? We, we need to be very careful with this. So the incumbents uh, basically continue using and continue propping up on uh, technology because they want to ret uh, uh, retain efficiency gains, gains and secure their market position. They need to transform uh, in order to achieve this. John mentioned it a little earlier. Then we have the big techs, already very nicely described by my colleagues, and this network effect you know, where you have this massive user base already there. And if you introduce financial services, like, for example, in particular, credit, yeah, consumer credit or payment services, you just have to send out a message to your massive user bases and you will generate business from day one that is uh, sufficiently interesting to sustain the whole thing. And then you have the fintechs, which come into the market in a niche, uh, I shouldn't say niche business, I should say in a very specialized, with a very specialized business, like payment, like uh, lending platforms, which are not one-stop shops, and they are entirely um, uh, technology driven. And John has come up with a very nice slide in the beginning, giving a couple of names here. For me, the big Difficulty are actually not what we call here the fintechs. The fintechs, at least in Europe, they have licenses anyway. Yeah, they are licensed. Either they have a full banking license, or they have a payment service provider license, or they have a license as a money market, uh, sorry, electronic money institution. And in that sense, they are already 
regulated and supervised according to what they do and according to the risk they are creating. For example, an electronic money institution, they don't do what banks do. They don't have uh, maturity risks. They don't have liquidity risks. They do not do liquidity transformation. Yeah? And therefore their risk profile uh, Loyana mentioned earlier the deposits. Yeah, their risk profile is totally different. Different, and therefore, if a fintech, as we call it here, fintech provider is licensed already, that would typically be sufficient according to what they do. So I'm personally not really concerned about these in regulatory term. They can become big, but we have big banks or we have other big service providers around for many, many years. Think of PayPal, for example. I don't think there's a problem. For me, the really big thing are the big techs. And um, I'm just trying to uh, look at the clock here. The big techs, they, because they have this massive user base, they come from an angle of the market, which is basically about providing technical services. They have a multifaceted role, and this is maybe the most important thing I'd like to talk about. They do so many things at the same time. They are cloud providers. Yeah, they, they run the infrastructure that all the others, sorry for this, they run the infrastructures that all the others need to use, uh, need to uh, provide their services. Um, that gives them a very powerful position. At the same time, they provide the ecosystems like the app stores, like the operating systems of computers and smartphones, which is the building block for FinTech overall. And now they start providing services directly. They typically end with like the little bits like payment, microcredit and so on, then branching out and providing more and more. And because they are so big, because they have such a strong uh, position, we need to think whether we have to reconsider regulation. Regulation, and that's also something that the expert group that I, which I chaired uh, came up with should work on the principle of same activity, same risk, same rule. It is very simple to assess well whether the inactivity is the same. Well, that's a lending activity, that's a payment activity and so on. The devil is here in the risk uh, element. Yeah? Big techs, they because of their branching up, because of their monopoly situation, because of the data that they hold, they create risks which are totally different from the risks that we know in the financial sector so far. It's not only that they, are, that they may become systemically important as massive payment service providers or massive credit providers in the market. No, this risk, the risks that flow from this, combined with other risks, which relate to the data position, which relate to the cloud service provider position, and so on. So here we really have to sharpen our regulatory thinking. And uh, in the interest of time, uh, I've, I come here with maps, what we have to do in the, in the future regarding fintech regulation. The most important, the most interesting for us here, talking about big techs, relate to the following. We have to make sure that there's a level playing field between them and other market participants, notably more traditional ones. We have to think about how to increase uh, resilience in prudential terms, because they are highly interconnected. It's a different form of an interconnectedness than the one we know from the banking sector, but it is definitely interconnectedness. We have to think about the risks from uh, data economy, including the regulation of personal and non-personal data. And we have to think about their massively dominant position which translates for consumers into the lock, so-called lock-in effect. We are facing this, and on that basis, we need to shape regulation and supervision. So that's my proposal. What we need is an integrated, especially for big techs, an integrated kind of regulation, which takes into account all these areas, financial regulation as we know it, with all the tools that we have at our disposal, including prudential tools, data regulation, and also competition regulation. And if you have read the Financial Times over the last two months, we are also rethinking competition regulation because so far that has been kind of reactive uh, or to a large extent has been a reactive kind of regulation. We need proactive competition regulation in order to avoid with tax the financial sector, what we have seen with Uber, yeah, moving to the market, kind of occupy the market and afterwards wait for the regulation to happen. That is extremely difficult. We can't afford this here in this sector because it's 
much more important than taxi services. So integrated risk-based regulation and supervision, that's my proposal for big tax. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Philip. Um, we went a bit over time, but uh, I think the, the richness of the information is uh, is key here. Um, let me actually, before I go to other questions, let me follow up uh, actually with one on one point on your kind of the last slide that you put up, and maybe you can put it up again, just so we can look at it again. I mean, this is a task um, which is far beyond the regulatory uh, brief of, uh, I think, anybody right now. No, I mean, yeah. if I think about this, the, the banking supervisor has maybe does micro brew. Maybe some in some cases macro brew uh, conduct sometimes. I mean, here in the UK, as you know, it's the FCA. Uh, consumer protection, partly FCA, can also be something else. D data. I'm not even sure who does that. I mean, who who is this? Who is supposed to take this on? I mean, this is a great proposal. Well, <laughs> well it, and it's even more complex because we need this on a national EU and it, it actually even international basis, and it would basically work like different agencies work together at the moment. I mean, if you want a practical proposal for this, um, there are now information flows and cooperation me mechanisms between banking, uh, insurance, and uh, securities markets regulators. And actually to this network, you just add two or three others. And then it becomes a market matrix structure because you have this on the various level, yeah? EU, uh, mm -hmm. sorry, national EU, and then international. Obviously it is complicated, but it is already complicated. I I agree, these structures, we do not have them, but I'm 100% sure the current regulatory thinking as regards the rulemaking and the current supervisory practice as, as regards the rule enforcing is insufficient to capture this problem. Okay, great, thank you. So um, there are lots of questions. I won't, we won't have time for all of them, uh, but let me maybe uh, start with some uh, and that is actually, um, um, we have to see whom I will start with. I think maybe all three of you can say something to that. The one thing, and maybe let me start with Loriana. Uh, you made a difference between fintech and, and banks. However, um, we've also seen cooperation between fintech and banks, right? I mean, uh, sometimes banks are actually investors and actually investors in the sense of putting their money for lending purposes into a lending platform, for example, or uh, banks give fintech companies space to develop their uh, technologies. I've seen this here in London, for example, uh, I think with Barclays. Um, so how do you see this? I mean, is it is this, uh, uh, can we expect the FinTech to be kind of like uh, just an annex to the banking system eventually, but being the more innovative part of the uh, of the banking system and then ultimately be somehow integrated? Yeah. And sorry, so, let me, before, I, before I go on, before I go on, sorry, let me ask, uh, add a second question, a second dimension, big tech and banks. The same discussion, and we had this, of course, also in other fora, as you know, uh, uh, Loriana. Um, I mean, do you see this actually as a cooperation arrangement eventually? So the big tech, the platforms being the ones that provides the, the fin big tech providing the platform, and the uh, the banks providing their um, their franchise uh, and the underwriting capacity, or is it going to be uh, just competing with each other? So over to you. <laughs> So you're Thank underneath. you very much. So let me start with the first one, fintech and banks. So, you know, I think that uh, uh, fintech are really playing a significant role for banks because they are helping them to innovate quite fast in some sense or, uh, you know, and, and it will be very easy on their certain dimension for banks to incorporate uh, different small fintech, let's say, uh, companies. But this doesn't mean that then the problem of you know outsourcing a lot of activities in the banking framework will uh, pretty much prevent the problem that I was uh, stressing as a market-based system because as soon as you have everything you know outsourced, then the problem is uh, uh, you know when one part of this uh, let's say source has not been provided, as for example the COVID crisis showed to us. Well, you know, then you, are, you create a lot of interconnection and dependencies of all these type of small institutions. So, you know, the question is how much this type of integration or uh, incorporation, it is still based in a market framework with different entities, or it is really, you know, incorporated in the general activities of the banks and banks do have all the control on them. Because otherwise, I, I do see some fragility from this point of view. Uh, moving to the other question, big tech and banks, well, the story is different here because, you know, in terms of size and the power, market power, uh, in the bargaining power of uh, between uh, uh, emerge between banks and big tech, clearly big tech do have a lot of uh, 
let's say, bargaining power compared to, let's say, a classical fintech institution. Mm. And this is why, even if there will be collaboration or even incorporation and so on, the question is who, who is having the control of, uh, you know, what it has been done and uh, the type of decision. Because, you know, we cannot imagine that you have, let's say, a collaboration with big tech and banks, and we are only regulating the bank and not the big tech, but the big tech is controlling the bank. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this, these are the type of thing that uh, we need to address. Mm. We've seen it with Banco Espirito Santo, who was uh, brought down by the, the rest of the Grupo Espirito Santo group in Portugal, and, uh, and that part was not uh, regulated. Um, thanks. Um, uh, John, you want, want to add on this one here on the banks versus, uh, banks versus or and uh, fintech, and then the same for big techs? Any view on that? Yeah, I mean, I think that um, th there are increasing examples of partnerships between uh, banks and, uh, and fintechs, as well as banks and, and big techs. And I saw in the Q&A, there was also questions, you know, do what, what is the more common, uh, the, the more likely approach in the future? Do we, are we expecting more partnership or more competition? And I think it is an open question. I mean, the, the trend until now seems to have been a move toward more uh, partnerships, there, there are more big techs that are becoming a vendor to financial institutions. Look at Ant Group in China, for instance. They've very much moved toward being a vendor to banks and you know, offering the front end, the, the client relationship, uh, the tools to reach users. But um, it is possible that at some point they reach certain scale and they say, okay, we're going to compete with these guys after all. Uh, we, we've decided we can do it better than them. Mm -hmm. And so I, I don't think it's a foregone conclusion. And I think that it is very important for regulators to look at this closely. These things can change very quickly. And if we do think that competition is important, if we do worry about market dominance, then we have to follow this very closely and uh, ensure that um, we have a framework that allows for fair competition in the longer term. Mm -hmm. Thanks. And let me turn to Philip. And this is kind of a question actually that relates to this one, but also an, it's an additional element in there. So now you have, for example, cooperation between a bank and uh, a market dominating uh, uh, pick a big tech, which would then, of course, the big tech company has already the kind of uh, uh, the market domination, but this one might also give the bank uh, market domination. And then the question is, well, should the big tech company actually be forced to share their data? So we know in the in banking, there, there are credit registries uh, uh, at central banks where banks actually have are forced to share their data. Do we need something similarly to say be provocative for, for big tech uh, companies that they, are, they have to sh uh, share their data uh, across other providers to kind of both for level playing field, but maybe also to distribute uh, the risk somewhat. Uh, oh, very much so. And I would even uh, say big techs have to share their data much more widely because uh, they are sitting on a common good and uh, dealing with it and treating it as, 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 if, as, if, as if it was their property. So this data has a value and this data uh, is also important for for risk for risk purposes, risk purposes as you say so absolutely yeah so not only in the event of cooperation which by the way i don't think is very likely that they really cooperate um but not only in that event but actually more generally we have seen uh, data sharing on the psd2 and we need a much more wider framework extending to different kind of different kind of data, not only personal data, also inferred data, and maybe even going further. I yes. think so. Right. Yeah. Well, maybe I'm, I'm wrong, but I, I thought that PSD two is only uh, only forces banks to share data. Does it also force big tech companies? Well, no, but if, if so, big tech, I mean, I'm just referring to this yeah, framework yeah. because we have this, we have already a data sharing framework. Yeah. yeah. So, but this would need to be expanded. Uh, something like this would need to be modeled also mm. on, onto big techs. Yeah. But the kind of data we are talking about should be much wider, not only payment data and not, all, not only personal data, also inferred data and maybe even going further. Okay, thank you. Actually, I'm going to ask you another question, and I think I'm not even sure whom to ask it, but I'm going to start with you, because you're also supposedly located in London like me. Uh, Brexit. How do you see the impact of Brexit, both, let's say, on the market development, but maybe then also on the regulatory debate uh, within the EU on big tech, fintech? Um, so on the market development, I think um, uh, fintech service providers located in London, and there's quite a bit of them. So out of the 15 unicorns we have in Europe, I think nine are located in London, eight or nine are located in London. Two are in Sweden and the, one is in Germany or two are in Germany and so on. 
and um, for them, obviously, this is a market. Uh, it's, a, it's a big obstacle. The passport uh, doesn't work anymore. So what what they do is actually they set up uh, continental subsidiaries. And I have just experienced this as myself three weeks ago. I was doing a transferwise uh, uh, money transfer between my German and my English bank account, and suddenly I got a message: you are not dealing with transferwise London anymore. You are dealing with transferwise Brussels. Mm. Yeah, and and that's fine. I think that is perfectly that is perfectly. Uh, fine. Um, in relation to policy making, um, well, there are various levels to look at. So, so far, uh, the, the UK voice in the regulatory debate was actually quite a progressive voice. And I think it was quite useful for the European market. Uh, and we are losing this. Yeah? So this, this um, progressiveness, well, we need to make up for this somewhere else. We must um, refrain from tendencies to protect existing market structures through inertia in the regulatory sphere. Yeah? Because we are not doing the clients a favor and we are not doing the market a favor either, where also the point of regulatory competition uh, plays in. Long term, we have to measure ourselves in these areas with China and the United States. Mm -hmm. and if we, if we are not progressive in Europe, we won't be able to sit at the table when the regulatory standards are set. And I think we are used to being at that table, very much at the top of this table, yeah. and we are about to lose this. And for this, it is a great pity to have lost the United Kingdom. Okay, good. Well, <laughs> their decision, unfortunately, but good. Yes, thank you for that. Um, let me ask you, let me ask uh, maybe Loriana a question. Um, Given your analysis, this nice graph that you had with banks and the market base and the big take, what kind of skill sets would you expect uh, regulators to have that, they, uh, that regulators need in the future? For example, if they take on this big task as, uh, as we saw in the last slide of, uh, uh, of Philip's uh, presentation? Well, good question, you know. Clearly, on one side, on one side, you need to understand, as uh, as Philip stressed, we need to understand who are the fintech and who are the big tech. But mm. on the other side, to be honest, I really think that we need people that have a general equilibrium approach, that are really looking to the externalities that this type of institution might create to the system, and uh, try to understand from the, let's say, the micro. Uh, level, so the micro aspects, what are then of these different, let's say, institution, what are then the effect in the system? So unfortunately, we need both capacity to understand uh, what are really, you know, these companies doing that is not so easy if you are thinking on, on the different dimension, but being also able to understand on how what they are doing will have an impact on the system. Thank you very much. Um, we're getting close to uh, 2 p.m., but I want to kind of uh, we take a few more minutes. Um, let me actually, John hasn't, I haven't talk, called on John for a long, long time, and I've had a lot of questions, and I wonder whether you have anything, any addition to make um, on these different questions uh, for our audience. Uh, anyone that I should uh, address in particular, Dorsten? Um, no, anything that you like to address. <laughs> So I, I just saw, for instance, um, uh, a question about interoperability, which I think is great. Um, so should big tech companies be legally required to ensure interoperability and to share data on clients with banks uh, in case they start offering financial services? And I think that interoperability in, in general is a very important point. And I think that um, this is precisely one of the problems at the moment. Uh, in payments, for instance, big tech providers uh, often have operated closed loop systems, you know, walled gardens, that are not interoperable with other payment systems. And I think that in data as well, we, we see that, um, I mean, there are criticisms that uh, PSD2 requires uh, banks to share their data with, with fintechs and big techs, but that there isn't necessarily, um, there aren't necessarily the same requirements or GDPR doesn't necessarily have the, the same uh, format and timelines for data sharing in the other direction. So I think that ensuring interoperability is important. Interoperability allows competition it allows users to choose which platforms they prefer and, um, and to you know, take their data and their funds with them. So I think it's a very important point and uh, certainly to ensure a competitive level playing field to ensure efficiency, interoperability is really key. 
Well, thank you very much. Um, very few minutes left, but let me maybe ask um, one or two more questions. One for Loriana, um, since you're based in, in, uh, in Germany, I kind of have to ask this question. Um, if my understanding is correct, that's the question, not my answer. Wirecard escaped proper scrutiny by BaFin because it is classified as a FinTech. Does that imply that uh, FinTech is not properly supervised and regulated? Or is it just Baffin that, uh, that messed up? <laughs> so, you know, uh, I wrote uh, several papers on this okay. regard. So, you know, I went very, very deep on the point. The problem is that not that uh, Wirecard were a FinTech company. The problem is that uh, they look just on the banking side and do not look carefully on the investor protection side. So on the fact that it was, uh, uh, you know, a quoted company uh, and uh, there was, uh, let's say, some misreporting. And mm. misreporting has nothing to do with fintech. Mm. So that's, I, I think, is something that we need really to consider that mm. is by chance that Wirecard was also a fintech company. But the, the, the big problem there, it was that uh, pretty much they misreport uh, uh, the actual, let's say, uh, performance of the company by not providing then right information to the financial market. Mm. And uh, Buffing do not, in some sense, uh, ex uh, ex uh, supervise them with the other hat that they are having, that is investor protection. Uh, and, and this is finally the result. So there is a lot of problem in terms of how the uh, auditor uh, the, did his job. Mm. And, uh, you know, in the way in which the supervisor were able to get information from the actual, let's say, number of wire card. Mm. But uh, this happens for, for uh, Parmalat in Italy, that was not mm -hmm. for sure a fintech company, but the problem was exactly the same. Okay, sorry, let me just, Philip, I know that you have to leave. Can you give us 30 seconds of what your, uh, do you draw any implications from the Wirecard uh, disaster for fintech, big tech regulation, or is it just, as Loriana said, completely separate? Sorry, I can't hear you. You're muted. Yeah. I, I agree with Loriana. Um, okay. uh, Buffin was captured, I think, and there was accounting fraud involved. You can never avoid fraud. Regulation will never be able. I think it's just a very, very big disaster, but has nothing to do with fintech. Okay, well, on this note, thank you very much uh, to our three speakers for these uh, all for sharing their insights. For answering all these questions. There were lots of additional questions. And as, as I said at the beginning, this is a very broad field. Uh, I, we didn't even touch the area of cryptocurrencies. Now, again, let me make the case for um, the FinTech course that uh, Philip is actually uh, uh, um, heading as a course director, which will uh, start in uh, about two weeks and will be repeated in September. And um, the recording of this uh, um, seminar will be online uh, shortly. And we will also ask these uh, presenters whether we actually share their PowerPoint slides. Again, thank you every, every, everybody, the speakers, uh, our technical team, and of course, all the participants for their active uh, participation in this uh, online debate. Thank you and hope to see you again soon. Thank you very much. Thank you very Namaste. much, Roy. Thank you very much.